Hello everyone, my name is Dr Sonia Bennett, I'm the Deputy Chief Medical Officer uh, in the Department of Health. Uh, this morning I'm going to address some of your questions, the top three questions that we're seeing on our social media channels. Uh, but first I'd like to start by giving a shout out to all the public health practitioners out there who have been working tirelessly really since the beginning of the pandemic. So if you've ever had COVID or been a contact of somebody who's had COVID, you may well have received a call from a public health practitioner, commonly known as contact tracers. Um, but the public health workforce is much broader than contact tracers. It includes public health doctors, public health nurses, epidemiologists, laboratory staff, uh, and infection control practitioners who all work together to really um, identify cases and manage the cases in their contacts to prevent ongoing further transmission in the community and the impact of COVID on the community. And I'm sure you can agree it, it, it can be a difficult task at times and they do it um, with commitment uh, and, uh, and dedication. So shout out to public health practitioners. But now to our first question that we're going to address today. And question number one is, will the COVID-19 vaccine be added to the childhood immunisation schedule? So COVID-19 will be with us for many years into the future but it's not really known yet how often and how regularly that we will need uh, further vaccinations. So it does make sense from a public health perspective to consider a COVID vaccine on the National Immunisation Program if we as a population require um, further vaccines into the future. But in practice, adding a vaccine to the National Immunisation Program is a major undertaking uh, with funding, purchasing and delivery models all needing to be worked out. So as we transition from an emergency situation to business as usual uh, in the coming months to years, we are likely to see these arrangements evolve uh, and more information will become available about whether vaccines are included on the NIP or not. And in parable, parallel, new developments in vaccine technology may see different vaccines and in fact different schedules and timings being introduced. So all that information is really important for us to understand uh, how we might manage vaccines into the future. In the meantime though, very important to note that everybody aged five years and over remains el eligible for a free COVID-19 vaccination uh, uh, and, and also those aged 16 and over eligible for a booster. So Australians can expect to continue to, to receive COVID vaccine boosters under existing arrangements and they are free uh, and they are available and accessible in, in many, many places. Um, so with the vaccines approved by the TGA at the moment. So our next question uh, is a little more complex. So the question is how common are false positive rapid antigen test results? So rapid antigen tests work by detecting the presence of specific proteins of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID. Um, and any rapid antigen test approved in Australia by the TGA must have an accuracy rate, which we call sensitivity, of at least 80%. So that means that at least 80% of tests um, we can expect to be accurate in detecting infection in somebody who has infection. What that does mean though is that up to 20% of test results, depending on what test you're using, might be a false negative. Uh, so it's very important that if you do continue to have symptoms, and you have a false negative rapid antigen test that you either retest or you seek out um, a test through a PCR test, which is our gold standard. Now, um, a false positive occurs when uh, infection is detected by the rapid antigen test, but the person being tested actually doesn't have COVID. They may be sick, they may have another illness, but it's not COVID. Now this is much more stringent. So the TGA um, uh, sets what we call a specificity rate at 98%. So this means that only 2% of tests might incur a false positive. So you can be fairly confident that if you have a positive test result from a rapid antigen test, you should manage it uh, as you're being advised to with COVID uh, and stay home and isolate for seven days, seek medical attention if you become very unwell. So that's reassuring that if you get a positive, you can be fairly confident that it is a positive. So the, the third and final question that uh, we're answering today is, can I get a Novavax vaccine if I've had a different brand for my first two doses? 
So we know the TGA provisionally approved Novavax for use in Australia on the 20th of January, just recently, 2022, for use in people aged 18 years and over. So you need two doses of Novavax vaccine given at least three weeks apart to be considered fully immunised with what we call your primary course. Now we know there's interest in the potential for Novavax being used as a booster uh, and we do expect that people who receive Novavax for a primary course will need a booster at some stage um, but th those details are still being worked through uh, and the approval for Novavax to be used as a booster is, is not yet in place. So anyone who has Novavax as a primary vaccine course, uh, if, if you're eligible for a booster, which is still some time down the track, three months, um, you can check then with whether Novavax is approved as a booster, and if not, we already have Pfizer and Moderna approved for use as a booster in those circumstances. So thank you for your time and listening today. I hope that's been useful in answering some of the questions, and we'll see you at the next session.